tonight. Changing tunes. The US makes an unexpected decision by submitting a UN resolution suggesting an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The new urgency by the isolated veto nation being added onto already growing pressures on Israel. Turning the tables. The EU mulls over a decision to hand over frozen Russian funds to Kyiv. The move essentially creating more ammunition for the fighting nation with cries of foul by the Russian camp. Decaying democracy. India's opposition leaders decry arrests of its leaders and freezing of funds of its campaigns. With elections looming, the motivations of the policing crackdowns remain in doubt. And mind matters. Want to play chess? Well, now you can simply think it into existence. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We have reached Friday yet again and safe to say we have had quite the eventful week with updates coming in from across the globe. Tonight we kick off with an unexpected update on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The U.S. has submitted a resolution on the conflict in a shift for the U.S. The resolution calls for an immediate ceasefire tried to the release of Israeli hostages. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said truce deal was getting a lot closer. The U.S. draft resolution on the immediate ceasefire went through a vote in the U.N. Security Council and has failed to pull through. There were 11 votes in favor, three against and one absentation. Russia and China voted the draft resolution that tied an immediate ceasefire in Gaza to release of hostages held by Hamas. Algeria also voted against the draft and Guyana abstained. The US representative to the UN Security Council, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, spoke after the vote, saying Russia and China did not want to vote for a resolution put forward by the United States because they would rather see the US fail, stating that once again Russia puts politics over progress. The UK's representative to the Security Council says she is deeply disappointed that Russia and China did not back the US draft resolution. She says the UK will continue to do everything we can to get aid into Gaza, but asserts that an immediate cessation of hostilities is needed to get the required amount of aid into the enclave. And over on the humanitarian aspect of the crisis, the United Arab Emirates has been hosting hundreds of injured children and cancer patients that have been evacuated from Gaza. This week, a new flight of children left to seek medical care in Dubai. For the 13th time, this airplane turned hospital is on a mission to evacuate children and cancer patients from the war zone in Gaza. At an Egyptian military base on Tuesday, it received ambulances carrying civilians needing life-saving treatment. We had gone down to the sea when they fired missiles, four missiles. My grandmother was injured and I was injured in my stomach. In addition to wounds from munitions, doctors said the children are showing serious signs of malnutrition, lighting up at the sight of something as simple as a banana. The plane will take the patients to Abu Dhabi, which hosts a housing complex that provides support and medical care for evacuees from crisis zones. A thousand Palestinians are currently staying in the complex, including about 150 civilians recovering from injuries and about 350 cancer patients. They gather every night to break their Ramadan fasts, commiserating and mourning how much they've lost. According to the Hamas-run Gazan Health Ministry, since October, almost 32,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's military offensive. We're over from one conflict to the next. European Union leaders arrived at a summit to discuss whether to use billions of euros in profits from frozen Russian financial assets to buy arms for Ukraine as they try to bolster Kyiv in its fight against Moscow's invasion. Weapons could be bought for Ukraine thanks to Russian money. Under a new proposal by the European Commission that would see the profits generated from frozen Russian assets passed on to Kyiv if and when the European member states approve the measure. I hope that we can reach an agreement soon and change banknotes into weapons because your soldiers don't fight with banknotes. They need physical arms, they need physical instruments in order to defend your people. 
Some 210 billion euros of Russian central bank assets were frozen after Moscow invaded Ukraine in 2022. Now, the assets are held in various currencies in the 27-nation EU bloc. While the exact amount Ukraine will receive will depend on global interest rates, early figures suggest it will be around 2.5 to 3 billion euros per year. 90% of which will be managed by the European Peace Facility to buy arms. The remainder will go to recovery and reconstruction. The Ukrainian Prime Minister expressed his gratitude and also asked for more. We insist on the full confiscation of other or other use of all frozen assets, I mean body of frozen Russian assets. Europe and the world need an effective precedent for making the aggressor pay a heavy price for the destruction it has caused in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman labelled the move as direct banditism and theft and claimed that it would be an unprecedented violation of fundamental norms. And now over to our neighbouring India, where democracy is seeing a bit of a dark time. Indian opposition leaders have strongly condemned the arrest of Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kerjewal. The leader of the Aam Aadmi Party was arrested in connection with corruption allegations relating to the city's policies over the alcohol saves. Uh, Mr Kerjewal has denied any wrongdoing and challenged his arrest in the Supreme Court. This comes with opposition leaders having alleged that his arrest is politically motivated. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party has denied all the allegations that say that it is merely acting against the corruption. Mr. Kejriwal's arrest by a financial crimes agency comes as a blow to the opposition just weeks after India's general elections. AAP is a part of the 27-party India Alliance aiming to challenge the BJP. Alluding Mr. Modi, Rahul Gandhi of the main opposition Congress party wrote on X, formerly Twitter, a scared dictator wants to create a dead democracy. The arrest of the elected chief ministers has become a common thing. Meanwhile, India's main opposition Congress party accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi of crippling it before the upcoming general election by freezing its accounts in an income tax case. And now in Australia, Australian Deputy Prime Minister Richard Marles and Foreign Minister Penny Wong hosted annual talks with their United Kingdom counterparts, Foreign Secretary David Cameron and Defence Secretary Grant Shapps in Adelaide. For more on this story, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Wishmi Gamage from Burwood in Australia. Wishmi? Yes, Anuradhi, the Australia-United Kingdom ministerial consultations comes after British firm BAE together with local naval firm ASC were chosen to build submarines under the AUKUS Security Pact. The AUKUS agreement between Australia, Britain and the United States will see Australia buy up to five nuclear submarines from Washington in the early 2030s before jointly building and operating a new class. SSM occurs with Britain roughly a decade later. The pact will see Australia become the seventh nation to operate nuclear powered submarines. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Vishmi Gamage from Burwood in Australia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more key global updates. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have some revolutionary lawmaking in progress tonight. The UN has adopted the first global resolution on artificial intelligence proposed by the US and co-sponsored by 122 nations as it seeks to protect personal data, monitor AI for risks and safeguard human rights. The United Nations General Assembly on Thursday unanimously passed the first ever global resolution on artificial intelligence. This landmark resolution encourages countries to ensure the protection of human rights and personal data in the face of AI advancements. It also calls for continuous monitoring of AI technologies for potential risks. The non-binding agreement proposed by the U.S. was co-sponsored by 123 countries, including China. This action is part of a broader effort by governments worldwide to guide the development of AI responsibly. 
And moving still in the tech area, Apple is seeing a lot of legal troubles. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced a landmark lawsuit against Apple accusing the iPhone maker of violating federal antitrust law by monopolizing the smartphone market. Apple denied the government's allegations in a statement. Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. Apple has consolidated its monopoly power not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. The lawsuit brought by the Department of Justice and 15 states alleges that Apple hurt smaller rivals and that it charges various business partners behind the scenes in ways that ultimately raise prices for consumers and drive up Apple's profits. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. But there's a law for that. Garland outlined a variety of allegations, including that Apple made it more difficult for competing messaging apps to work smoothly on its phones. If an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user in Apple Messages, the text appears not only as a green bubble, but incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted, videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. As a result, iPhone users perceive rival smartphones as being lower quality because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse, even though Apple is the one responsible for breaking cross-platform messaging. Garland said the aim of the lawsuit is to free smartphone makers from Apple's anti-competitive behavior, bring down phone prices and developer fees, and preserve innovation. Apple denied the government's allegations in a statement, adding that if the DOJ's lawsuit is successful, it would, quote, hinder our ability to create the kind of technology people expect from Apple, where hardware, software, and services intersect. The lawsuit is part of a broader crackdown on big tech in the U.S., where regulators have also sued Alphabet's Google, Meta, and Amazon during the administrations of both President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. And on the road to the White House tonight for campaign talks, we're talking about new filing showed United States President and Democrat Joe Biden's re-election campaign had more than double the amount of cash on hand than his predecessor and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump ahead of the presidential election in November. Take a look. The cash disparities between Trump and Biden were seen in the filings with the Federal Election Commission, which required campaigns to file fundraising and spending reports for the last month. However, the report only covers a part of the committees associated with those running for office. Biden at the end of February had $71 million in cash available in his main campaign account, which is more than double of the Trump's $33.5 million. The filings show that the former president received more than $3 million in his campaign account in February, which added the $30 million on hand in January. However, the incumbent president, which had $56 million by the end of January, added $15 million in February. While Trump is in the lead in more nationwide polls, Biden and the Democratic Party have growing a cash advantage. The Democratic National Committee, according to the filing, had more than twice the cash on hand when compared to its Republican counterpart. However, the report does not show the entire picture since Biden and Trump are raising money through joint fundraising committees, which will not file their reports until the end of next month. The cash gap may see some upsets being caused on either camp, with the polls showing near ties for the candidates. And on some interesting news tonight, Finland once again tops the World Happiness Report that measures social support, income, health, freedom, generosity and the absence of corruption to determine a country's national happiness. Finland is topping the list for the seventh year in a row, closely followed by Denmark and Iceland. For more on this story, we have other than the World News special correspondent Panchali Ratasekara from Helsinki in Finland. Panchali. Yes, Anuragi. According to the report, Norway, Sweden, Germany, France, the United Kingdom and Spain are countries where the old are now significantly happier than the young, while Portugal and Greece show the opposite pattern. Happiness among the youth, aged 15 to 24, has also fallen sharply in North America, while Central and Eastern Europe saw the largest increases. 
The report stated the happiness had declined in the Middle East and the North Africa, with the larger falls for those in middle age groups than for the old and the young. War on Afghanistan and Lebanon remain the two unhappiest countries in the survey. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Pachali Ratnasekar from Helsinki in Finland. And now an update on the doctor walkouts in South Korea. Medical professors have offered to take a step back from plans to resign next week in protest of an additional 2,000 med school slots being available from 2025. They say they are willing to reconsider their act of protest if the government is willing to negotiate. The government has responded by saying it is open to communication and will also be deploying additional support to mitigate the medical staff shortages starting next Monday. With medical professors also threatening to resign in protest of the government's plan to increase the number of medical students, the government is attempting to mitigate concerns over further medical staff shortages. Speaking at a meeting of the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters in Seoul on Friday, Prime Minister Han duk -soo announced that the government would be deploying an additional 247 military doctors and doctors from public health centres starting next Monday to fill the empty slot left by the walkouts. And starting next month, a senior doctor support centre within the National Medical Centre will be opening to provide further support by hiring senior doctors near retirement. The Prime Minister also addressed the medical professors in a plea for them to reconsider their resignations and added that the government would continue close communication. Government will continue to communicate with an open mind. Any suggestions that help protect public health will be reflected in the health care reform agenda without delay. Calls for dialogue also seem to be growing within South Korea's medical community, with medical professors due to convene again on Friday afternoon before submitting their resignations next Monday. Speaking during an interview with a local broadcaster on Thursday, the head of a group of medical school professors hinted that the professors could sit down for talks with the government and even withdraw their resignations if punitive measures imposed on junior doctors are lifted. He also called for more objective data before increasing the medical school admissions quota. We are not opposed to increasing the number of medical school admissions per se, but we think that it could be possible if an acceptable figure is obtained through objective verification. However, the government's plan to increase the quota by 2,000 is not objective data that any doctor can accept. Meanwhile, the Medical Professors Association of Korea has announced that it would reduce the working hours of hospital professors to 52 hours a week starting next Monday. They will also minimize outpatient treatment starting in April. The decision was made to focus more on treating high-risk patients. Also starting next Monday, the government is set to begin suspending the licenses of trainee doctors. Starting next week, the government will enforce license suspensions for doctors who have defied the return to work order. The health ministry has issued prior suspension notices to about 5,000 trainee doctors who must submit their responses by next Monday. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Tonight we have for you some good news on tackling climate issues. Even if we do our very best to reduce our own carbon footprint, it's inevitable to see levels go up because of massive industries and their outputs. To tackle this issue, there is a brand new solution focusing on the naval field. This may look like some crates on a cargo ship, but it's actually an onboard carbon capture system designed to suck carbon emissions from the air and turn them into stone. It's one of the ways the shipping industry is exploring to reduce their climate footprint. The global shipping sector transports around 90% of world trade. It's also responsible for around 3% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. The UN Shipping Agency has set out targets for the industry to reach net zero around 2050. But getting there won't be easy. Unlike the car industry, for example, shipping cannot simply electrify its fleet to reduce the carbon footprint. Another possibility is capturing ships' emissions and storing them on board. UK startup Seabound is developing a carbon capture system designed to fit on the deck of large cargo ships. A pilot trial on a 45,000-tonne container ship, the Sunyun Trader, 
captured around 80% of CO2 emissions and 90% of sulphur dioxide. Carbon capture's role in emission reductions has so far been limited. The process is expensive, requires enormous amounts of energy and water to separate CO2 from other gases, as well as heavy upfront capital expenditure in capture plants. Seabound says their system simplifies the process by decoupling the carbon capture phase from the traditionally expensive recovery and storage phases. The company says they are now working on a larger demonstrator and hopes to capture more than 55 tonnes of CO2 per day at more than 90% efficiency. And finally tonight, it seems our sci-fi novels will finally see some reality as Neuralink shows us the brand new power of the mind. Noland Arbaugh is playing this game of chess with his brain, using a chip implanted by Elon Musk's startup Neuralink. I'd like to introduce you to the first ever user of the Neuralink device. Yeah, my name is the company live-streamed the event on Wednesday. Arbaugh in January became the first patient to receive a Neuralink implant which seeks to enable people to control a computer cursor or keyboard using only their thoughts. The 29-year-old was in a diving accident eight years ago that left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. Do you want to explain a little bit what's going on here? Yeah, so um, I love playing chess, and so this is one of the things that y'all have enabled me to do, something that I wasn't able to really do much the last few years, especially not like this. Um, I had to use like a mouse stick and stuff, but now it's all, uh, it's all being done with my brain. If y'all can see the cursor moving around the screen, that's, that's all me, y'all. Um, it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Actually, can you pause the song just for the yeah, audio absolutely. coming through? There we go. And that was also done with your brain? Yep. <laughs> it's all brain power up there. <laughs> Our boss said that while there was room for improvement with the new technology, it had already, quote, changed his life. Former program director for neural engineering at the U.S. National Institute of Health, Kip Ludwig, said what Neuralink showed was a, quote, good starting point, but not a, quote, breakthrough. Last month, reported that U.S. Food and Drug Administration inspectors found problems with record keeping and quality controls for animal experiments at the firm. Those findings came less than a month after Neuralink said it was cleared to test its brain implants in humans. The company did not respond then to questions about the FDA inspection. I'm pretty sure soon we will be seeing quite a few more developments in that area. Maybe I can think things into existence now if we see Neuralink coming here to Sri Lanka. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight, wrapping up this eventful week. We'll see you again on Monday with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you very much for watching. Have a restful weekend.